About two weeks ago, a news story started making the rounds that caught my eye. Physicists find in the early universe, gravity can turn into light. But each article I read kind of left me unsatisfied as to what that actually meant and how that could be possible. Basically ending in, so gravity turns into light, isn't that cool? But where were those juicy universe details? But I imagine, if you're like me, you're probably curious to understand what on earth is being proposed here? So I thought today, let's try and understand how the universe turns gravity into light. The paper is titled Graviton to Photon Conversion via Parametric Resonance, a catchy title if ever I've heard one, but the underlying message suggests that everyday things that we're used to, specifically gravity and light, don't always behave as we expect them to, particularly in the early universe, and might be able to transform from one into the other if the conditions are right. To understand how, we have to go back to the starting point of the universe, the Big Bang. The Big Bang is the most commonly accepted theory among scientists about how the universe started. We know from observations of the cosmic microwave background radiation that the universe began as a hot, dense ball, a nearly uniform state approximately 13.8 billion years ago. But how it got from that to our current universe was pretty hard to work out. In 1980, physicist Alan Guth, please don't come at me for that pronunciation, theorized that infinitely small and dense proto-universe grew in size in fractions of a second to pretty much the scale of the cosmos that we know today. This period he called somewhat unimaginatively cosmic inflation. Goose proposed that in the early phase of the universe, all of the energy of the universe wasn't in matter and particles or radiation, but was in the very fabric of space itself. And an interesting part of why this theory has stuck around, because really it was the only theory that kind of explained all of the things that we see in our universe today, and is so appealing to modern physicists, is that it helps us explain why we see some of the structures in our universe, from the scales of stars and planets, to things like galaxy clusters and sheet light -like structures of galaxies, which are separated by enormous voids in space. Guth believed that it was the slight density fluctuations in the fabric of space-time at its earliest proto-universe stages that ultimately were responsible for the structure formation that we see in today's universe. But after the Big Bang, the universe cools rapidly, from extremely high temperatures that can create strange particles that we've never seen in our universe, even inside high energy experiments like the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, to a period of much cooler expansion. What Goose inflation explained well was how the universe came to expand so fast with such uniformity, and why we don't see those rare particles, things like magnetic monopoles nowadays, because after inflation, the concentration of these early particles in the early universe would have been so low that they probably don't even exist in the observable universe. What, however, it struggled to explain was why so much stuff, matter, and radiation does exist in the universe in its place, and why hadn't it met a similar fate to the magnetic monopoles. Our more modern theories of inflation built upon Goose's work to solve these problems, and to understand how, we're going to have to understand a bit more about the stages involved in cosmic inflation. But first, a message from today's sponsor, CuriosityStream. The best place to find and watch documentaries about science, history, technology, nature, travel, and so much more. I've been trying to stay off social media recently. Ten minutes that I otherwise might spend on it, I've instead tried to learn something. Curiosity Stream is amazing for this because everything on there is high quality educational content. Yesterday I watched a documentary on the very first gravitational wave detection and another one on how the first image of a black hole was captured. Curiosity Stream has exclusive award-winning films and shows that you can't watch anywhere else, plus the deepest collection of the best documentaries from around the world. Deeper, I think, than any other streaming service out there. The content spans science, nature, history, technology, tech, military history, music, and so much more. So regardless of your interest, there's probably something out there and CuriosityStream adds new shows every single week. If you're interested, go to curiositystream.com forward slash Dr. Ben Miles or scan the QR code 
for an unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series and use promo code Dr. Ben Miles and you will save 25% off your subscription. Now, back to the video. In modern particle physics, elementary particles can be represented by quantum fields. For instance, there's the photon, the unit or quantum of light, which is associated with the electromagnetic field. The same, interestingly, can be said for the inflationary field, which was responsible for the rapid rate of expansion of the universe after the Big Bang. The particle associated with inflation is the inflaton, because there's only so much creativity in particle physics naming conventions. The inflaton is a theoretical particle, which means that it hasn't actually been found. Some physicists think that it might be something like the Higgs particle, but at the moment we really don't know what the right candidate actually is. The inflatons that make up the inflationary field contained the energy that drove the rapid expansion of the universe. But as this process continued, the inflatons behave in a really strange way. Much like an object held at a height can be thought of having a potential energy that when dropped reduces to get converted into kinetic energy, the energy of motion, so too do inflatons their potential energy looks something like this. During the rapid period of inflation, the potential energy of the inflaton and the inflationary field is largely constant, only slowly decreasing. We call this period slow rolling inflation. This conversion of potential energy is what is driving the expansion of the universe. However, when the potential energy drops below a certain critical point, it suddenly drops rapidly into a local minima, causing the period of inflation to suddenly end. To put in perspective the scale of this process during inflation, the universe expanded so rapidly that two particles that were an atom's width apart before inflation would have been more than a thousand light years apart when inflation finally ended. And when I say finally ended, this all happened in less than a second from 10 to the minus 36 seconds after the Big Bang to 10 to the minus 33 seconds after the Big Bang, fractions of a second. Slowly though, this inflaton field oscillation loses its energy, leading to a period of rapid temperature increase across the entire universe, known as reheating, or in some cases, preheating, and the creation of relativistic particles, producing the radiation-dominated universe with ordinary matter, no magnetic monopoles, that we see today. But how does this answer our initial question? How does gravity actually change into light? The oscillation of this inflaton field can produce this resonance in any field, including the gravitational fields of the primordial universe. Oscillating gravitational fields are more commonly known as gravitational waves. The team behind the publication showed that if the inflaton resonance coupled to the creation of gravitational waves in the early universe, this could create gravitational standing waves of incredibly high energy. In places where the refractive index of light is greater than one, meaning gravitational waves move faster than light waves, this could result in gravitational waves driving oscillations in the electromagnetic field, essentially creating a shock wave that generates spontaneous particles of light, light out of the fabric of space-time. This is somewhat analogous to Cherenkov radiation, which occurs when electrically charged particles move at speeds faster than the speed of light in a specific medium. We see this happening in things like nuclear reactors as a blue glow. Although the research team reports that this process for gravitational waves creating photons out of light is inefficient as a process, in the early universe it still might have been possible, and hints at a connectedness of the fundamental forces, at least in the early stages of our universe's history. If you want a particle physics rather than a field description of what's happening here, you can think of a standing gravitational wave as a collective behavior of two groups of massless gravitons, particles of gravity, traveling in opposite directions. At high enough energies and densities, these can collide and decay into other particles, in this case photons, just as a pair of high energy photons can collide and decay into an electron-positron pair. 
This is a process nowadays though in our universe is incredibly rare as these high energy gravitational waves no longer really occur. The researchers did suggest that there was potential around binary black hole systems that we may find similar gravitational wave environments. However, the refractive index in these sorts of systems isn't usually greater than one, meaning it's difficult to create those shockwave-like environments. So they're unlikely to evidence light creation. As theorized in this paper, this probably can only really occur at the beginning of the universe, where everything was incredibly hot and dense and space-time caused the fundamental forces of nature to act in strange ways. But understanding this model might teach us more about the connectedness of the fundamental forces and help us one day unify them into a single theory, something which has shown just how wonderfully strange our universe actually is. If you like this video, feel free to leave a like, subscribe if you're new, or hit the join button to see an interview I did recently with an academic behind the double slit in time experiment. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.